Yo, Adam, what is good, bro? How are you feeling? Great, man. How's it going, bro? This is our the- first first fake rare session, dude. Um, coming right off the backs of the rare Pepe sesh. We're ready to build. We're ready to hang out with some good frogs. Bunzi, what's good, bro? Good morning. Yeah, I think good to see Bats again. It's been a while since we chatted and excited to chat with Jake and you know the fake artists have just been making fake stuff for too long we have to see if they're real or not do they have voices i'm excited for today but um but yeah bat good morning my man how you been good morning dude doing uh doing good um i uh have been in meetings meeting hell all morning (laughs) so this is a this is a nice very uh much needed break for me um so yeah i appreciate y'all having me out from from what I see, Bats might be the buffest frog artist I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, yeah, Multiple frogs that. are an army. Bats is a, one of his arms is an army. Uh, I see. I see what you did there. Uh, so Jake, Jake to Jake connection, man. Jake, free dude. I love your art. I actually had no idea you were a fake rare artist until we created the the collection, the curated collection, and I was like, I have seen this art many, many times on my timeline. So. Very, very excited to talk with you, bro. How you doing? Yo, thanks for having me on today, Bats. I'm a huge fan, and no one more qualified to talk about fakes and Pepe than Bats. So it's an honor to be with you guys today. Yeah, absolute pleasure. And then our two other co-hosts, Dog Father Man. How's it going? Yay! I'm already feel entertained, man. I'm looking forward to the one of the fakest spaces I've been in here. So big fan of you guys. Um, yeah, looking forward to what you're, what you're, yeah, the alpha you're sharing. Absolutely. And Chris, how's it going, bro? Let's go. 
banger space yesterday. Pepe's are flying, fakes are flying. Uh, ready for a, for a solid space? Let's get it going. Oh yeah! So for those that are watching the live stream, I've pet pinned the top Pepe sales. We have Pepe Beef Taxi for two weeth, Package Claim one point five two weeth, Pepe Trader one point three nine eth, Pepe Mining one point three five eth, Miko Pepe one point two, Gox Pepe and Fire Ass Pepe point nine, and Faka Life point eight eth to round out the top sales of the week. Pepe's are catching some interest. We've seen the rare Pepe collection now sitting, I think it's in the top 50 right now on OpenSea. No doubt in my mind, it'll be continuous number or top five just because of the sheer size. I think fake rares will eventually get there as well. We obviously, from the Emblem side, we need to create a few additional tools for bulk minting, but then the attention is getting out there as well. So it's a very, very exciting time. I want to lead off the question, um, similar to something we were discuss discussing yesterday um, during the, the Pepe Fest and uh, Bitcoin Amsterdam recap show, we were discussing kind of this philosophy of Pepe and how Pepe is this malleable kind of art form, you know, that extends into everything from generative art, traditional art, right? The physical art that was at, uh, that was at Pepe Fest. Uh, I'll leave this off with the bats, man. Um, tell us a little bit about your your Pepe story. Um, when did you come across it? And then at what point did you in in time did you say, "Hey, this should be my uh, art form that will get me into the NFT space"? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, gosh, where does it start? Um, I, you know, very much. I think like like most people here, a um, I am a kind of product or or child of the internet. You know, just grow up on the internet um always getting involved in like niche cultural things uh that being said was like i was on 4chan quite a bit um and ran into pepe during those days where i was very active so kind of like my introduction you know just like i'm sure y'all are aware funny ass memes on 4chan of, of pepe um which was you know like i said that's that my introduction to it i i that time i didn't necessarily frame it as uh you know, and necessarily an art form or really even think about it in that way. Um, I wouldn't say it wasn't until I got involved into the NFT space that I really started to view it um, as such. So I so I got in around, uh, or at least I kind of started taking more notice of it around the time when I, I I'd been following people forever. Um, I'm a, I've been a digital artist since uh, the late 2000s, uh, followed people for quite some time. And uh, I was like, oh, this NFT stuff is really, really interesting to me. Uh, had been previously involved in crypto as well. Um, and so just, you know, getting involved with the space and then learning about things like rare Pepe's and, and, and fake rares, all the things that kind of preceded um, my joining of the space and just coming to understand the, you know, the significance of, of that, you know, it's literally like kind of the gateway into what we now know is the broader NFT space. Um, then kind of fast forwarding a little bit, um, I, you know, as an artist, I had minted stuff for a couple of years, never sold anything, um, you know, kind of tough as an artist, not going to lie. Um, but yeah, I just stuck with it, found these communities or, or people that I really connected with. Um, and the number one being uh, a, a, a Pepe type of community, which was um, based on smalls by Dark Farms. I'm sure everyone here is aware of Dark Farms, fucking legend, the the master frog himself. Um, so I got involved with that community, met a ton of great people, um, and really it I, it just inspired me to create. I, I didn't necessarily like, especially during that time, uh, which was summer, early or like late spring of last year. Um, whenever I started creating these kind of Pepe derivatives and what we now know as geometric Pepe's, it, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily thinking about it in the context of minting or selling these things. It was much more like I've kind of found my tribe within the space, um, the smallest community, the Pepe community. And like, that is what I really, really like. And that is what I'm, you know, focused on. I just, I gel really well with all these people. Um, and so I just started creating, you know, what, we now know it's geometric Pepe's and um, I think started to formulate uh, stronger opinions just about 
um, not necessarily just Pepe as art, but like memes as a contemporary form of art, um, which, you know, I, I've, I've tweeted out probably like once a week, but I do believe very, very strongly that memes themselves are art. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of the short of it. I mean, lots of, lots of nuance and a lot of uh, things have happened, but uh, yeah, here we are. And I, I do have to say it is, if you would have told me a year ago that I would be sitting up on a stage with Jake and you all talking about fakers and shit, I would have never believed it in a million years. So just know that this is a pretty sur surreal experience for me to uh, be doing this. So I, I, I really do appreciate y'all having me up and, and having me involved with this. Yeah, you're an, you're an absolute legend, my friend. I remember, I think it was at some point last year, um, it was a few of those geometric Pepe's that ended up taking off. And it looked like, it seems like ever since then, uh, it's really never turned back. Um, and you've only continued to grow since. Yeah, and I, um, you know, I, I, I credit that to me unknowingly, um, kind of curating a great collector base, uh, that, that whole geometric Pepe, like core collector group or just a bunch of fucking legends. Um, and, and I, I just, I love them all to death. Yeah. We, we appreciate you. What is good? Bit God GM to you, bro. How you doing? GM man. Uh, man, I'm like a, I'm like a huge fucking fanboy of, of bats. Um, you know, I don't, I don't usually get sort of too nervous, but I'm actually kind of nervous right now. I think, uh, <laughs> Man, like, like, bats, same, uh, same. I'm, I'm just a huge, I'm really a huge fan, man. Um, Thank you. Uh, I was really actually wondering, you know, your, your creative process behind um, some of the more recent stuff I've seen, uh, I think that you've been teasing really, right? Which is uh, this sort of like generative output that has mm -hmm. a lot of those, those uh, like Pepe colors and uh, it's a lot of, I think, what, mainly like rectangles. Um, yep. and, and yeah, so like, I'm, I'm really curious, like, Maybe just in general, your creative process, but like those in particular, I've absolutely loved and, and yeah. really looking forward to in the future. Yeah. I, well, thank you, man. I, I really appreciate it. Um, it, it this, uh, I, I think like my process behind all of that is, um, and this is really kind of how Geometric Pet Pets began too, is the the idea of breaking something down, um, in, in this case being Pepe or to a a, a larger extent my, my generative uh collection just memes in general um breaking them down into what you would consider like their most simple forms um which are you know basic quadrilaterals rectangles and their colors and are those things instantly recognizable by that that approach and my 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 effort is to really like nail that and and geometric pepes really taught me that you can um and i'm a designer by background like uh, it was always just like minimize things um less is more type of approach so i think i took some of those findings um just as my years as a designer to break it down and try to make things just as simple as possible so they'll, but still capture the essence of the beam and, and basically um that is kind of I, I would say that what you're speaking about the generative outputs is um almost like a, a culmination of that idea or the past year and how i've kind of studied and just um you know thought about art thought about memes um it's what you're seeing with all of that yeah it's uh it's an absolutely fascinating story uh i got one more question for you and then uh, and then we'll we'll dive into to jake I've pulled up here the um, we, Adam and I live stream for those that don't know. That's why we're talking through the the same um, the same account. I pulled up here the come and meme it the Pepe ledger that you actually created as an NFT. It looks like maybe five to six months ago, and then recently, or even more, seven months ago, as I'm scrolling, and recently Ledger posted that they are going to actually create this and turn it into a reality. Uh, take yeah, us through it's, pinned up, it's pinned up top. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, take us through yeah. that experience, and then have they reached out to you and said anything uh, specific about it? <laughs> oh man, yeah, dude, that is just. Oh, I, I just don't even know how to think about all that. Um, yeah, so that well, going back like the common meme it thing. Um, I so basically it was a re meme of a meme by Vince Van Do. He had done just like the initial ledger, and um, his was like the come and take it. Um, 
you know, kind of flag that we all know with the, with the ledger on it. And so of course me memeing that, um, changing it to a Pepe ledger, come and meme it, um, which, you know, I, I thought was pretty, pretty fun and clever at the time. And even during, during that time, I was like, oh, it would be so cool if we had like a Pepe ledger. We had even talked about it in the uh, geometric Pepe chat, um, which is, I think, probably a reoccurring thing through a lot of my work. I feel like they're kind of like my consultants. Um, but uh, and then it was last week or yeah, I guess this was last week. Uh, I don't know. Time just kind of matches these days. Um, one of. Uh, one of the members of the Geometric Pepe chat, generic username, shout out generic, um, had, had uh, God, I can't remember the story exactly. I, I think he had a dream or something like that about, you know, fuck, what if we had like a, a Pepe, like a Geometric Pepe ledger? And I was like, hold on, just like, let me cook for a second. I'll go into Cinema 4D, I'll build one. We'll render it out. We'll, uh, I'll, I'll tweet it at ledgers, see if we get any response or anything like that. Um, and to my like absolute shock, they responded pretty damn quickly. Um, they even started working on prototypes. I think within 24 hours, um, which is just I, it is just like so crazy. And so they uh, they they have reached out to me, and and we are chatting just about like a a broader kind of uh, larger production of this thing. Um, obviously, y'all seen the y'all seen the prototypes. Those which which definitely are, are not true to the actual rendering or like at least my vision of, of what that would look like. And they understand that too. They're, they're absolutely privy to it. I think they just, uh, they wanted to kind of keep the momentum trending a little bit, give away a couple of prototypes, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, so of course I'm fine with that, but uh, to, I, I don't want to say too much, but yeah, we're, we're working on like a, a, a much, much broader kind of like, um not mass production but a much larger release that would be like an official collaboration so um yeah i'm super excited about it and i think um you know i think it's really great when um especially this is kind of why i wanted to lean into it so or i think it is great when larger companies like that do embrace the community in this sense um i mean i, I think if people know kind of how i tweet i like to uh poke it say like exchanges or they said you know whenever pepe coin was going off or whatever like kind of poke at exchanges and try to get them to embrace that part of our culture and for ledger to do that you know within 24 hours is i think pretty special because they're huge everybody knows them um so it's just cool to um uh, yeah it's just cool to see them do that and, and really just be a part of it um, yeah. I mean, how, 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 how crazy is it an awesome a space really where, you know, you can put this out, whatever, what'd you say, Jake, five months ago, six months ago, and, and then it actually come to this, you know, I mean, it's just, we're so fortunate to be in this space, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. what's Sorry, crazy guys. on that note is like in this space, everything's like, if it doesn't pop off in a week, it's old. Yeah. And like, this is like a cool testament to like what these artists are creating do have longevity, do have, you know, because the NFT community and these, you know, I'm not saying all, but there's a, a section of like, if the art doesn't do something in a month, doesn't get like something notable like this, they're like, oh, it's whatever. But <clears throat> I think this is just a good signal, a bat signal, if you will. That's, <laughs> like, <laughs> that's like, this art can, you know, like remain and be used because that is a, it's so significant and it's so cool for the Pepe community to like, to be a part of something of that legitimacy. And uh, I don't know, I just wanted to, to make that note because it, it's, it's strange. We're beautiful pieces and especially going to, to Jake's work is like, that work is like timeless. And um, just, just how quick people move around art um, in the digital space is, it's crazy to me, but um, I don't know. This was this was something of significance to to point out. Yeah, yeah, good, good job. Yeah, J Jake, man. Um, uh, first, thank you for coming on, and also fantastic name. Uh, your art is very unique. Honestly, I am not an artist. I have no idea how to even go about describing this. Um, uh, but it's absolutely brilliant and psychedelic. Uh, we'll start with you. Pitch it. Sa same question of like. How did you come to create your art style and then and then eventually come to finding Pepe and deciding to um, put uh, a card into 
the collection, which I believe is Series 9, Card 21. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I will jump off what Bats was saying with Ledger. Like, when you see a company do that, it you, it's a real embrace of the actual space here and authentic, and it humanizes the different people and, and groups and, you know, a lot of anonymous people here from all different places. Um, there's something about it that feels like it's it's bringing us together. And uh, what really attracted me to their fake rares originally was just the great art and the diversity of artwork there. Um, so I have a lot to say, but I'll just say, like, it's one of those collections of work where there's so much just diversity of expression and voices and levels of talent and, and all that stuff. And it's really cool and authentic and real. And there's not a, that much of that in this space, really. Um, and it's really special. And I agree with you that it's it's going to age really well. And um, I don't like it's like the memetics and what Bats is doing, like, versus maybe other forms of art, like I didn't just make my bake rare and then it's done, that's it. It's like a living thing that I remix and repost in it. <laughs> it has stories with the collectors who own it and like it's been hung in you know shows in Miami and New York and like it's a living object uh, like and, uh, but to back up, I've been making hand-drawn experimental animated films for a long time. Um, and uh, I'm a professor of animation and my work was in festivals and I did commissions and things like that. Um, but my work's mostly lived online and has been like online native, like short form digital video. Um, and like a lot of artists in this space, it was difficult to find a market for it or to build community around it and to, and to really have it be valued in sort of like the traditional gallery system uh, that a painter would experience. Um, so this space and the technology really fit perfectly. And so when I got into the space, it became very clear early on that, you know, Pepe plays a huge role in like storytelling here in the memetics and that learning more about uh, rare Pepe is that like, it's like the OG kind of like artwork uh, on chain. And like, that's really important um, and needs to be respected. And I think any artist in the space needs to understand that history or they don't truly like understand the ecosystem. Um, and then, so I started minting work in 2021. Um, and in 2022 is when like, especially when VVD did series eight and, uh, some of just like the legendary, uh, fakes in that series. And I was quite frankly, like jealous and, and like, <laughs> like, oh my God, I have to do this. And then like, what a cool, there was more of that vibe, honestly, last year, we need more of that again, but like with TGO's blue and stuff, just more of that vibe of like, there's ways to bring my artwork and my style into like the broader conversation here. And that interplay between artists in the space is one of the most special things that's happening um, and shouldn't be overlooked that like most art, you know, like there's photographers and, and digital, uh, you know, designers like bats and, and painters and musicians and animators like me. And we're all just sort of like co-mixing and that's such a cool thing for the art world. Um, anyways, I was super jealous. Uh, and like, I was like, it was a challenge. Like I need to make, my own fake, my Pepe, like, what would it look like? And then, so that would, I think is what makes Faker so special is like, it is a mirror. It's an empty canvas. It's, and it's a way to add like basically your self portrait or your own artistic voice to this, this collective. And so I really think of fake freed as like, how can I, um, how can I compress like who I am as an artist, like my point of view, my aesthetic and have it be like, fit in with this larger collection and be something ideally like iconic. And that's not something I generally think of when I'm making like my films or my art. Um, but I was like, it's gotta be short form, like really short. So this, my fake rare seven hand drawn frames. Most, you know, my films are like thousands of frames. So it was like, for me, a challenge in um, being really efficient. And then, yeah, I think my fake rare, it's like, it has pathos. It has like the hand drawn quality to it. It's, um, and I think like a lot of Pepe's like, I hope, and I want all my work to do this, but it's, it's, it's like, it reflects you. So like the, I'm the expression of my, I, I hope is mixed or layered that it can, it can feel like sad. It can feel stern. It can feel like, um, loving or like looking right at you i don't know i want there to be like i want you to have like sort of a serious connection with it 
which I, which again, like thinking about my artwork in the space, like I'm taking this thing that can be silly or a joke or a meme. And like, I'm trying to bring like, I don't know what you're saying, like timeless weight to it. And that's, which is yeah, like, I hope it stands out. You know, it's like, that's like a mimetic approach to the meme. It's like bringing seriousness to it. And it's, that's what's so, I don't know. There's just so many different approaches to it. I kind of have a question for you with like, you mentioned one thing about having seven frames and that's one thing about fake rares and rare pepes is the restrictions of like sizing it gives artists and it kind of puts, you know, people say artists think out of the box and everything, but like it puts artists with restrictions and in a box to some degree. But I feel like that's when artists like really start to thrive at some points, which is like, okay, I do have to do, do this within these parameters and they get creative with that. Um, you know, with that. Yes. So we, that's why I think so many like non artists are kind of like hobbyists really are drawn to fake rares and pepes is like, I'm, so I'm a professor of animation. I could go into a class and be like, all right, you guys all have like five hours to make an animation that expresses who you are. Or I could say, this is like what a Pepe is like, this is what fake rares look like. What would your fake look like? You have five hours, make it. All their work would be better with the second prompt because they have a strict limit and task and they can think about their work and their voice uh, with, with, within structure, within boundaries. And honestly, a lot of what I'm doing as a professor is creating those limits and boundaries for my students so they can explore safely without kind of going just like all over the place and, and feeling really aimless. That's and, so interesting, especially from the professor standpoint is like, yeah, you would think artists would like flourish and like, okay, do whatever you'd like, anything, the no, no restrictions. And you think that's where an artist would be like, come up with some of their best pieces. But I, I feel like you mentioned like the second prompt of giving them, you know, a jumping off point, some restrictions, and then allowing their creativity to bounce off of those to kind of really get the ball rolling. But um, I, I agree. I think it's it's one of my favorite parts about it. Just like and I think that's what's allowed so many different artists from so many different mediums to come and use Pepe as a canvas in such like a meaningful way. Agreed. And I want to just highlight again, Bats is like brilliant at doing it, um, that all their experimentations and all their different styles and forms are all unified by this one form. Um, and it really is just like what, like two black and white dots, some green and red. Um, it's brilliant. It's awesome. I I, I <laughs> have a lot of faith that it's going to be a, a, a art form that continues for for many many years, and they're going to have a lot of importance. And uh, I mean, this is about the marketplace, and you guys are talking about you know merging them over to Ethereum and things. I just want to say, like, I fully believe, like, and I would not be surprised if my fake or the fakes that I own, I'm lucky to own one of those Joe pieces. That's another angle I'll just put out there right now. Like certain artists like Joe P's, like don't even have editions out there. Or, like their work is completely inaccessible to someone like me, but I own like their fake. I mean, it's amazing. Um, and so I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these fakers actually are extremely valuable. Yeah. Just because it's pure fact, they're also generally supply of a hundred or less um, your fake, I've pulled up here on, on the screen for those who are watching the live stream. Uh, one sale so far on Ethereum at 0.69 ETH, currently listed at 1.2, um, 35 that are vaulted. Uh, Jake, may I, may I ask, where, you said you're a professor, you have students. Where, where are you teaching um, your skills and your artwork at? Yeah, so I live in Boston. I, I taught at the Museum of Fine Arts for a long time and then <clears throat> now teaching at Mass Art, Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Wow. Um, and mostly experimental animation things. And the, yeah, I'll just say, I mean, I'm on my own artistic journey, but like before this space, I fully believed I was going to be a professor or like have to my whole life. Um, and now uh, in the space, I'm obviously a lot able to sell my art um, in a lot more ways. And I've been able to like kind of extend my teaching in my classroom to this community. So one of my favorite things is is sharing my favorite experimental animated work on the timeline um and promoting and bringing community around animation yeah. experiment and animation it's it's really it's That's incredible and I, the last thing i'll just say is like what fakers did like a lot of people discovered my work through through my fake rare like as an artist there's only so many ways you can reach new audiences and do it in like a thoughtful organic way um and that's what happened here and that's beautiful. 
Yeah. What's so cool too is in your journey, knowing you wanted to be a professor and your, you know, art career took off as well. Cause you know, I have a several buddy, I used to be in the music industry and that was like after, you know, their music career wasn't where they wanted it. They became, became teachers, but knowing that you did the other way just sounds so fulfilling. Um, kind of just another question on like, what software are you using to put together all these, these layers? Cause these are so intricate and I would just love to hear like, say like, what's your average frame and like hours put in to, to one of your pieces? Because it just looks so detailed and I can't even fathom doing this in like something like frames in Photoshop or something. Uh, I'm just curious of like what software and around how many hours does goes into a piece? Yeah. So I heard there's a lot of interviews and I talk about this. So I hope people will check those out if they're more interested. Uh, all my work is hand drawn and talking about limitations. I, you know, like 15 years ago started realizing like these strict limitations I started as just a painter, a traditional artist. And then I just kept reworking my paintings and my drawings and like kept fucking with them and never finishing them. And I, I did sort of fall into animation kind of backwards being like, oh, I just, I like the way this thing changes and moves more than like making an image. Um, and so I kind of, and this is all around the time, like the internet was, you know, social media was new, the internet was new, um, streaming video was possible for the first time. So my animation career sort of evolved out of traditional painting along with the, you know, the internet and stuff. Um, and what I do is I rework the same drawing. So the, my fake freed is like, literally I drew the first frame, then I, I redrew over it and I redrew over it. So all those little dots, all the little marks, all the little details are just pen and ink on paper. And I scan it in one frame at a time. So my work is physically made, but because I'm reworking over the same drawing, the, the physical is destroyed. Like there's, the, the physical keeps shifting. The, the work itself is the, the digital record. I literally just posted about it this morning, like an hour before large. space. So you're saying I, every you know. time you add something, you pick up the piece of paper, scan it again, and then go back and keep drawing. And then yeah, so you literally look at your... Yeah. <laughs> wow. So you just... The piece that's up, you post it on top. Um, yeah, it's just ink and white out on one piece of paper. It's one minute long. Every frame is unique. It's 24 frames per second. So that's 1440 like iterations of the same drawing. That took me like a full year. Um, so yeah, meanwhile, I'm teaching and I'm in the space full time, but uh, it takes a really, really long time. Uh, and kind of my whole, talking about like the seriousness of my Pepe or whatever, like my whole ethos as an artist is just like <laughs> intense amount of labor and like serious pursuit. And like the, 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 the act of drawing itself takes a long time, but really the hardest part is like the work is improvisational. It's one frame at a time. And I don't like, it's not storyboarded. It's like I'm trying to like find something through making it. So crazy. Because most um, improv kind of happens quickly. Improv to me is like, okay, that's a quick iteration. But you're improving over, you said, a year's time. Yeah. When when you said the whiteout, like say by the end of that piece, is it like thick as fuck? Is it like Yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> wild. That's I mean, that's why wow. they the end. They get so textured and layered that they they kind of like become impossible to work on anymore. Um, and yeah, uh, then, and so what I've been doing recently is like, I make prints from like the, you know, the digital images of them. And I, I did, I want to call this out with the space. Like the, there is a one of one fake free print signed by me. That's all, you know, seven frames laid out. Um, and fungible from Schiller owns it. He won it in an auction on scarcity during, um, our Basel last year in Miami. Um, but yeah, so the software I use is just like I scan stuff into Photoshop and then I just compile all the frames in like Final Cut Pro or Adobe Premiere. Um, and I'll just, because I'm on this stage now, it's just like I just did a post about a piece called North Star that's like my work really isn't just the animation. Like that's what's kind of hard to explain about my work and why my work is like uniquely digital art. Um, it's not just the animation. It's like it's a collection of frames. And like I was saying before, like, it's also about the way I remix it and, and tell the story on social media and just online. Like I've posted probably like two dozen remixes of my fake free by now. Um, and I, I just think of my work as like, I create this, this looping animation, but it's like, it's a collect, it's a, it's a documentation of that process. Like the process is my art. Um, and when you're watching my films, like you're saying, it's like watching me 
do an improv it's like a guitar solo that was like drawn out over a year and then compressed back down to like a minute um so the process takes a really long time but then the, the work itself is like really quick and loopable and um yeah i i also i think people are familiar with my work and see this like i kind of want my work to grab you and not let you go and like uh, be kind of hypnotic or like i don't know how to explain this but like a lot of art art can be so many things right but like for me i really want my artwork to almost be like this thing that's like pulling on you and like it's like got this this property of magnetism to it um and definitely accomplishes that it's yeah so that's cool right good it's mesmerizing and mimetic no, i'm just no but it's uh it's it does capture you and it's because the first time you get like the the overall kind of concept of what's happening. And then the second loop, you start to get focused on the details. And then the third loop, you get even, it just keeps drawing uh, deeper and deeper, which is the looping part of it is, is brilliant because you can't get it all in the first go. And uh, it's, it's, it's so fascinating. and so awesome to hear such passion behind work because some artists, I think they just try to humble themselves and say like, Oh, you know, it's whatever, but it's, it just it just came for me or whatever, but I love how how deep you dive into like the meaning and what what you want it to do in the world. I think that's that's really admirable. Yeah, Jake, I got one more question for you. Um, and speaking of you know kind of the narrative of humble, uh, I was looking through all of your artwork here on the live stream and on Super Rare. You know, this wasn't even mentioned. There's four sales that are near 100k, 89k, 175k, 115k, 113k. How, first, first question would be: How do you kind of balance between, you know, selling these artworks or having them resold for these, you know, astronomical prices that adds a lot of credibility, um, and then also teaching? How do you manage that work-life balance? And then also, when you're teaching these students, um, and do they know that you're also selling frog pictures on the internet <laughs> and, and random pictures for 100k while teaching them? <laughs> Yeah. So well, let me just say, I've been able to cut down on teaching recently, which has been a blessing because I don't know if anyone here is in the higher education field, like there's teaching and then there's all the other shit you have to do, like <laughs> planning and advising students and like meetings with chairs and stuff. And so thankfully I've been able to sort of like just stick to the teaching part recently. Um, and yeah, it's what a gift to like recognize what you do for the money and what you're doing because it's what you love to do. It's never been, a, I've never made art for money in the first place. So like, I feel really lucky. I'm in the age and stage of my career where like, this is a, I can deal with it quite easily because uh, I've built my whole life in a sustainable, you know, career and kind of pr practice for myself before this space. So, um, and what's new for my life is I have a young daughter who's four. I have more kids on the way, which is very exciting. And like, I just feel like the stability of that, that comes through selling the art is like, it's what am I supposed to say, man? It just feels like I feel blessed, but it also feels like I did. I've been following my own path for the right reasons. And like, it, it, it doesn't feel like um, I got lucky or like, I don't know. <laughs> it, just, it just feels very natural to me. And the truth is like my lifestyle hasn't changed a whole lot. I bought a lot more art um, and like, I, yeah, I feel a lot more safe, um, which is really nice um my students this is so complicated <laughs> they students are like i'm like it's hard for me to remember but i always have to remind myself like i'm an authority figure in their lives and my opinion of them really matters and so i have to like they're more worried about themselves they don't right they're not like um but they the biggest thing is that they can really appreciate my opinions and my feedback like are coming from a, a real place of like like I, I'm genuinely interested in like what being an artist means. And like, I'm trying to make a career of it myself. And um, I know my students really respect that. Like I'm playing the game. And when I'm giving them feedback or talking to them, it's like, I have real world experience because not all their teachers really do. Right. Um, and yeah, I think it's, I mean, like, it's very cool for me because yeah, like as a teacher, you want your students to think you're cool. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they're all young people like 21, 22, or like, I think a lot of them are really talented and to be frank, like way more plugged in and kind of hit people day to day than like I have the, the pleasure of being, uh, 
And so when I'm talking about the stuff I'm involved in or like the musicians I work with or like the shows that I've you know worked on, um, that they think it's cool is like definitely important to me and makes me feel like I'm plugged in. I'll just say too, like talking about Pepe's, like Matt Fury, um, you know, some of those animations that he's been putting out the past year or so, like those are some done work done by some animators like in my community, like experimental animation community. And like some of the best independent animation out there right now is wrote is of is around um the Pepe figure and Matt Fury. And like um I feel a, a lot of crossover to the quality of the the vibe of the this community with the um like kind of underground animation community that I'm a part of, like with Adult Swim and, and stuff like that. Um, so my students, yeah, they, they really love like cool, hip, underground experimental animation and shit like that. And the fact that, uh, yeah, what's happening in the like NFT space and, and with like Pepe's and stuff like that, it's definitely like on their radar and they think it's cool. And that's that's cool. Dude, ab- absolutely beautiful story, man. Um, really awesome that you can kind of balance both of these and, and educate the youth. Uh, we do have on stage board Elon Musk. Uh, dude, GM to you, bro. Do you own any fake frogs? Uh, I don't, sadly, but I think that needs to change as of today. This is a, a great conversation. Uh, I saw Batson here, big fan of his work. Uh, he did a set for the uh, the Opepin project, and that's kind of how I learned about him. And that really opened up my eyes around Pepe. Uh, but Jake, I uh, definitely want to explore your stuff. I know we've been following each other on Twitter for a bit, and uh, I feel naive and ignorant now for <laughs> not going down the rabbit hole. So that's that's going to change. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of wanted to get your guys' perspective on the character of of Pepe the Frog. Um, I'm somebody who, back in the, the times when I worked in the corporate world, represented a video game company that was very protective of of uh, intellectual property and the characters that they had built and they, you know, they nourish them and they let them appear in many different formats, but at the same time, we're very uh, draconian about um, artists and other people doing stuff with their characters because they didn't want them to be uh, represented in a way that they weren't comfortable with. But on the internet, you, you do see the emergence of these kind of decentralized characters. Obviously Matt created Pepe the Frog, but it's really become its own thing and there's been 10 million iterations of it uh doge is kind of a character uh, in a similar category but i'm curious just kind of how you feel as an artist like you you mentioned um liking the constraint of working within this framework of, of pepe but um what are sort of the pros and cons um of of you know creating art around a character that you have really na- no say over and does it make you nervous sometimes that you know, people create very cool and interesting things out of Pepe, and sometimes they create horrific things that aren't so good out of it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just trying to get your perspective on that. Yeah, uh, Bats, would you like to to take a swing at that one? Yeah, yeah, it's an um, yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about. I I would say that uh, personally, I have. Like as an artist, not not necessarily struggled, but I do get like, you know, there is a voice sometimes that creeps into the back of my head that like, you know, all you're ever going to be known for is that guy who you know just does a bunch of Pepe work, right? Like, <laughs> which is okay. I mean, you know, that that's fine, but like, I wouldn't want to be pigeonholed in, into that. I I think. Um, but what's been what's been beautiful about all of this is that, um, you know, it's it's kind of freed me in a way to really explore the the things that I want to and, and, and take it to different levels, which is kind of what you're seeing with, you know, the, the generative collection that I'm working with. Like it gave me that confidence that like you're, you're trending in the right direction. Um, and I think like to the point of, you know, IP or, um, you know, just creating work around a certain character and stuff like that. I what I love and what I connect with so much about um, like fake rares and rares in the Pepe community is that uh, you know artists should just be able to do whatever the fuck they want to want what they want to do, um, and there's such a massive embrace of that within this community, right? Um, and I think that's what just like keeps me here too. Not only is like the community great, but just like the attitude and the feelings, the the thoughts around it. 
um, is really like a, a, a beautiful, beautiful puzzle or piece of the puzzle for me. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think too, like I, it's allowed me to also feel more comfortable, I think, to share other art that I've created that is not necessarily Pepe based, like um, the nine and the portraits and, and stuff like that. Um, I think it was, it gave me that little nudge that like, you know, as an artist, you, you, you know, not to speak for, you know, all the artists out there, but I'm sure a lot of us kind of go through a lot of self-doubt um, and, you know, questioning of, of what we're doing. Uh, is it good? Is it not? Um, and this whole past year um, has really, I don't know, enabled me to, I think, just generally be more confident in, in what I'm doing and just trust my intuition. Um, so, yeah, kind of kind of a ramble, but that's about it. And I think too, um, what you were saying, Jake has spoken about it, Board, you had just mentioned like working through constraints. Um, that is something that I am like, like creative freedom through constraints. It's very much like a kind of like a mantra within, at least for me, like going through design school, studying, being, being a designer for the past decade or so. Um, it is like a... I, I don't know. I, I feel like constraints to me allow me to flourish. You you, you kind of present yourself with a problem um, and they're now destined to find the most creative solution to it. And, and I think that's awesome. And, you know, that's one thing that I really do love also about, um, you know, OPEP and, and, and what Jack is doing is that it is very much that same exact mindset that you have this particular constraint. What creative thing are you going to do to... Um, I don't know, either make it fresh or, or put your own spin or, or your signature on it, right? Um, so, yeah, hope that answers your question, man. I appreciate you. Dude, I love that. Creative freedom through restraints. That's like, that's so true. And just, I don't know, just the <laughs> community. And yeah, I, I think that just embraces it super well. That's a quote right there. Yeah, it is. It is quite <clears throat> great answer. Sorry about that. Um, so for those that don't know, Fake Rares is available on Ethereum. You could go on OpenSea, type in Fake Rares. All of the collections will pop up. Uh, Bat, uh, Geometric Pepe uh, is available for 0.4 ETH. I think there's 30 copies right now. Uh, Jake Freed's Freed, Fake Freed is available for 1.29 ETH. But we also do have another Fake Rare artist on stage who is also our co-host, Bunzi. Um, Take us through same questions, man. Um, you're a memer, right? You're the creator of Mullet Punks, and then somehow you found a way to create a Mullet Pepe called Mullet Party as a fake rare. Um, how do you um, how do you plan to intersect Pepe um, with your mimetic art form? I mean, <clears throat> yeah. First of all, I, I have no fucking idea. Uh, <laughs> but, but second of all, it's like. I think just the most interesting thing that, you know, fake rares and this meme community has been able to do is identify an era and before history can reflect on it, we're like actively embracing it, which I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sure that's happened in the past before, probably like industrial revolution and all these things of like, but in hindsight, it's going to be clear of what was happening. But right now it's, it's fascinating to me that people are, you know, communicating through memes they're able to express more deeply what they feel and people are talking about extreme topics that they typically wouldn't talk about in person. But if they put it on an image, now your aunt's talking about some crazy political shit online. And I know that's not always what we want from memes, but I think there's something crazy to be said there. It's like it, images cross languages, cross borders. And now news like it really does travel at the speed of memes like if it's significant enough some really big monumental thing can happen and something random could happen but memes will flood the internet and that's the information that everyone consumes so i think it's just like a very interesting thing to participate in but then on the the, the pepe side again it's like going back to this constraint thing is like and being a part of some of these these galleries for for um, rare Pepe's and fake rares, it's like it brings artists from every single medium. And what's really cool about this is when say maybe Jake can relate to this in the animation thing, in the animation field is like 
you get a lot of animators together and there's like, yes, there's this competitive relationship where everyone's trying to outdo each other. But then there's this kind of like, you know, people overanalyze stuff. But when you have a, a medium where everyone's so different and everyone's coming from a different place, everyone really embraces each other. Because when I came from the music industry, it was like, when you got deep enough, people started like hating, like, oh, you're not doing it this way. Like, this is, uh, you got to be mixing down vocals and pro tools. How are you doing that? And like logic or reason, that's not the professional. And people forget about like what, what you're trying to do. And they get like really fixated on how you're doing it and, this, and the silly nuances of it. So like the, the Pepe community, like people using Pepe as a canvas, coming from every walk of life and just coming and doing something and getting like embraced with open arms. Like even Bats alluded to it, like just having that confidence as an artist and like being embraced, it sounds it's it's rare because like most like artists, it is it is a very vulnerable thing to do is like this is what I made everybody <laughs> like do you like do you like it? Do you not? And like once an artist can feel comfortable, I feel like that's when they create some really, really cool stuff. Um and they really like enter into you know, that weird section of their mind that like, they're like, oh, if I go there, no one's going to like that. That's fucking way too out there. But that's kind of a long, long kind of rant. But I do think like what it's done for me is I stopped creating when I was like 26 in the music industry, just because like it chewed me up and spit me out. I toured for like seven years, ended up at the like the end of it, just like, I don't know if I can keep doing this, like paycheck to or like just rent was barely made and all this stuff. So I got into software development and I really never thought I'd like create like I am today. But then I got Skrilla on my podcast and he told me about like Pepe's and, and I was like, what the fuck? Like you're making hip hop beats and putting gifts over them. Like this is, this is like exactly what I thought crypto and NFTs were, but people were just making generative 10 K collections, wash trading them. And just doing some, I don't know, just really, I didn't really get it. But then when I found this, it was people kind of like in the underground, if you will, like really embracing the tech and, you know, just making some really, really cool stuff. So once I got him done, uh, like once that podcast was finished, I was like, I need to make a fake rare. So I started making him, sending him some. He's like, nope, nope. (laughs) Like the scientists were just like, nah. And it, it was cool to like go through that process of like, this isn't a joke. This is like, yes, it's very mimetic and, but there's, there's, there's levels to this shit. And that's what I really liked about it was it was um, organized chaos and just a group of people putting like together a big movement. And I guess just the, the way I'll wrap this up is like, I, I just think, identifying how important memes are and just leaning into that before like 50 years go by. And then we reflect like, Holy shit. Like elections were one-off memes, like whole types of groups were formed off of these things. I think it's really important to identify and like just experiment with in live time before, you know, someone looks at it because most people are like, Oh, it's so simple. It's words on an image, but it's it's much more than that. So just being a part of it and making making you know fun collections and meet like even meaningful collections at times, you know, with most of my work leaning into like fun and like uh, kind of the mullet party and all of these things. But I do think there's an undertone to it of just like you know there's there's a lot to be said and memes are a powerful way to like communicate, you know things that you can't always do with words. Adam, what are, what are your thoughts on the entire conversation? I know you're not purely an artist, but you do do great deep dives of tweets about Pepe and memes and all these other um, aspects of the crypto space. What's your takeaway from the conversation so far? It's interesting. I think when Jake was talking about, you know, making a piece of art, but then almost there's this whole nother level of work that begins where you have to communicate the art uh, through the X platform to your collectors. Um, I think in in my experience of talking with lots of artists over the last couple of years and interviewing for podcasts and stuff like that, um, you know, the great artists are able to do that. 
the great artists are able to have this kind of, some people would call it salesmanship. Other people would, would call it communication, but this ability to connect with collectors, to tell a story and tell, tell them about their art or why their art's important or whatever it is. Um, but to tell that story is really, um, it's a whole nother gift uh, or work that you got to put in beyond just being a great artist. And I think, you know, you can, we look back on, on these kind of great artists that we deal with all the time, Jake, we're very fortunate, get to talk to great artists all the time. And you see the, the really good ones are able to do this communication aspect uh, above and beyond make really interesting, compelling art. Um, so real honor to talk with you guys today and, and hear your stories. Yeah, they are it's some great stories. Somebody commented on the live stream named Pimping Keck said, I completely missed the fake rares. I was banned from the rare Pepe telegram until 2021. <laughs> missed a bunch of stuff that happened on him. I don't know if Joe, if you're the one that banned him down there. <laughs> that's, uh, that's an integral part of the the fake rare story. Maybe that was Robness's Rob uh, alt account right there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, integral part of the story for those that don't know about fake rares. Um, Skrilla is down um, as a listener. Um, I think Skrilla posted a, a, a non rare Pepe. This is before fake rares were created in 2021 and got banned. And then later in 2021, um, created their own collection. Uh, it's much better said on the website itself, but uh, kind of funny because that is a very integral part. But it's interesting because Pepe kind of began on bitcoin right or, or rare pepes began on counterparty which is on bitcoin and then slowly after fake rares it kind of moved over to ethereum you know vince vando did a really good job with his gallery and then started notable pepes um, they've kind of taken on a, a little bit of a you know a different community on each side but have kind of morphed together uh, so i'll leave this to, to bats is when you go and create pepes um, are you also looking at the canvas? I guess if if the blockchain is a canvas, do you take that into consideration when when creating art, whether it's on Bitcoin or ETH or or I know you have some work on on Tezos as well. Yeah, I think honestly, I, I would say generally, I don't think super deeply about it. I probably just have more bias towards, as I feel like most people do, just more bias towards ETH because. That was like my introduction to it. Um, but with that being said, and, yeah, with that being said, I think that um, I, I definitely need to be, I don't know, I, I feel like I have this want, and I don't know when it would happen, but contribute to more of that like um, Bitcoin side of all of this, just because there, there's like a really, there's like a really, there, there's just a lot of significance to that, right? And I, I understand all of this is like, um, all of this is like still super new. Like I, I try to remind myself of this um, every day, just because and y'all are all aware that this space moves like so fast, like things just happen so quick. But if you think about it in the grand scheme of things, or at least this is how I think about it, it's like um, we have this really long book in front of us and we're, we're still on the first page of that book. Right. Um, and I, I need to, it would be a, a service doing to myself if I were to go and I think pursue more options on Bitcoin, just because of, I think like the significance of it. And that's just how it is for me as an artist. Like, and I, over the past year, I've, you know, really become a lot more privy to how all of this happened and how all of this formed. And where it was truly like rare Pepe's opened up the door for this entire thing really. Right. Um, just like the idea of it and, and true like digital collectibles. So um, we we gotta yeah. connect. I gotta help you get some yeah. some stuff inscribed because <laughs> that's, that's I, knew, on Bitcoin. I knew you would love that. I know you would love that. I, <laughs> I would love it so much. I mean, and and the file size is perfect. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh! I'll show you how to inscribe well, and well, get you. Well, it. that's what. Uh, just if you didn't know, we helped uh, Coldy do a uh, a collection as ordinals but then release them through Emblem Vault on Ethereum. So his collectors didn't, so he could sell to his collectors, but they could actually collect ordinals um, just in that fashion. So he could meet his collectors where they are, which is all on Ethereum, but yet still play around, you know, in the ordinals ecosystem. Um, so if you ever wanted to do something like that, we could definitely help you out, man. Lots of options. Yeah, and if you want to yeah. make ledgers too, I got three. 
<laughs> uh, no, but Jake, Jake, are you thinking about Bitcoin at all? And um, do I need to orange pill you or? Bro, when, when we oh, bring yeah. Emblem over to, to, to Ordinals and, and you can bring your ETH NFTs to Ordinals. We'll bring it get back. ready, bro. Get ready. It's happening. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually the first time I'm hearing about that with the Coldy thing. That's actually kind of exciting. It's called Filthy Fiat. Yeah, we'll have a. I'll, I'll send it to you once uh, once it's migrated over. I, I'll just say like I have my DMs every day <laughs> are full of people asking me to do ordinals with them. I don't know what it is. The community. <laughs> yeah, there's, but you there's guys like are relentless, and it's kind of like now it's like. There's so many of the messages, I don't even know what to fucking do about it. Um, but one thing I will say is like, yeah, it's that push and pull between trying to embrace the space, but also trying to bring in more collectors and make this thing we're doing here more mainstream. And I'm really, I'm honestly torn about it. I go back and forth. Um, and well, let me what, fix that. Let me fix that. So I think it's like meeting collectors where they're at. And I think with Emblem Vault, it's a perfect way to like, allow both like both groups but just from like a data storage layer the the fact that it's just immutable there's no ipfs involved there's you know more restraints again that we talked about that we liked it's four megabytes um or if you want to get creative billy down in the crowd did a very unique way of um you know pointing these inscriptions to each other to put together a very large image so it does offer a new world of restraints and as long as Bitcoin is going to be around and the nodes are running, like your your files will be secure and stored, which is an interesting thing. Because once you start opening up the tech side of Ethereum, um, you know, a lot of these are just pointing to IPFS. And if you don't pay that pinata bill or something, it's very similar to hosting a website. Uh, those files could get taken down. That's very unlikely. But again, it's more of the the concept and the narrative of like etching into, you know, marble or something along. And and there's rare sats. Oh man, we can go so deep, but I get it. Uh, I do get it conceptually, but again, yeah, my my priority is my artwork and like uh, telling my story. And uh, I just want to always do things for the right reasons. Um, and I am really interested in what the possibilities what we can do with contracts and different things with chains going forward. And uh, I'm actually going to be exploring that more very soon. Um, so I hope if you're you're not familiar with my work, you look you. Uh, Pay attention to what's coming next. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I will say just the conversation about like what's been frustrating, but also kind of interesting about the fake rares is the difficulty in, in getting them until really recently with what Emma Vault is doing. Um, that I have a Discord with like, you know, 700 people in it. Like people love the fake freed. So many of them are like just not willing to do free wallet. They don't fucking get it. They're like, it's kind of, which made it cool. It's like, wow, this thing, this NFT of Jake's, I like can't even figure out how to get it. And then these people who are smart, who knew, you know, how to buy one and then take it over to OpenSea, were selling them and making good profit from it. But like, um, to me as an artist, it was like, I don't want my work to be hard to get. <laughs> and I don't want to make this thing more confusing to the people I'm trying to um, onboard. But at the same time too, it's like when like my students or yeah, my fans on Instagram see that I did a Pepe, they're like, what? I don't even get the context of what he's doing um and that's cool but also frustrating so it's it goes back and forth for me yeah and now there's there's a variety of bitcoin protocols you could do it through there's count you have counterparty bitcoin ordinals uh, stamps atomicals um they're just gonna keep growing but hopefully the user interface does grow um, with those protocols as well because it's definitely a little bit of a laggard I do want to ask, yo, Chris, who's been on stage, one of the newest members of Emblem, what's your what's your takeaway from the conversation? Are you a fake rare owner? Do you own rare Pepe's? Um, what do you think about the artists of fake rares? Yeah, for sure. I've been loving it. Um, we got into rare Pepe's like early 2020-ish, Jake. I mean, you started mm -hmm. deep diving them, um, started collecting a bit. And just the absolute range of how it's kind of a free market for art and artists to express themselves within those parameters is just like so incredible because you have kind of a baseline but then everyone freestyles on top of that and it just offers like such a dynamic collection all in all like from something like jake freed's work to bats going on on ledger and just the overall range of everything involved and just how small it is today but how it, it's you know it continues to accelerate in growth going forward and how big it's we all know it's going to be in the future 
And just to kind of like have a clip of time of where we're at when that artist was, you know, putting that digital artwork out and how it'll be looked back on, you know, from the beginning of the digital age is just so incredible. So it's such a huge cultural moment and, uh, you know, truly love being a part of it. Pepe is our, yeah, to one of the, the underlooked values a lot of people don't realize, uh, Rare Pepe by market cap is actually the third or fourth largest in the entire NFT industry. You have punks and then apes, and then Rare Pepe has been sitting around the same uh, market cap as, as mutant apes. Um, they're both sitting around 250 to $300 million in market cap. So, just and we know it hasn't even started yet, right? Hasn't I mean, even started. Not, you know, I already put out my prediction. I was like, 2024 is year of the Pepe guaranteed top spot on OpenSea, man. I have zero doubt. Or I, when I when when I got hired at, at Emblem, um, I did research on Rare Pepe to see like what's the possibility of the amount of tokens I could actually like end up on on OpenSea. If you omit um, any of the cards that have over a thousand supply, it's two hundred thousand tokens, right? And so then if you go past a thousand supply, which there's a lot, there's got to be at least maybe four or five hundred of those tokens, right? It's literally becomes infinite um, at some point in time. And right now, it seems like the majority of those who are buying rare pepes and fake rares on on OpenSea tends to be the um, higher supply, I guess, cheaper or lower value cards. I think it's because Users are really just trying to get their feet wet. It's a little bit different when it comes to fake rares and rare pepe because there's no built-in rarity system, right? There's no traits where it's, hey, we could calculate this percentage and this obviously is the rarest. Um, it generally comes down to the community. Um, it's a community rarity system, which it takes some people to get their head uh, wrapped around that idea. Uh, but over time, you know, I think it's a very healthy sign that that's kind of where people are getting their feet wet. Uh, what's up, Dogfather? Yeah, what I also mentioned is, uh, you know, I'm not an artist. I never made it into the fake rares. I just have a few comments, so I'm just not good enough. But I, I like to look at the data. And the cool thing about the, the rare papers and the fake rares is we have around 300-something different artists on uh, in the rare papi collection. So it's very diverse. And uh, plenty of them were also active in the fake rares. But we also have, you know, the newcomers and fresh blood. And I think both... Uh, are very important, so, you know, the OGs from Rare Pappy, you know, like Skrilla and, and, and many others, but also, you know, like established artists from other chains, you know, just to, to bring more eyes, uh, more attention, uh, different techniques, more diversity to, to the fake rares. So I'm, I'm pretty bullish on both, um, trying to collect as many as I can. And yeah, really looking forward to do, I mean, once we really have another rediscovery of, of Rare Pappies. Yeah, yeah, it's really exciting. I kind of see Rare Pepe as kind of this, you know, historical art. It's the beginning of the decentralized crypto art movement. Obviously, you got to give some, you know, some prestige to Spells of Genesis, which came about a year before. But in terms of like this community curated um, art environment, it definitely starts with Rare Pepe. And I think the market has definitely really, really um, displayed that as so. Uh, I do want to call on Metamoon uh, first, who came on stage, and then we'll go to Bunsy right after. might be on mute or you might be engagement farm anyway um, <laughs> could be one of the two all right go ahead buns yeah just another thing i wanted to mention about fake rares is to to get a release not only does it go through the the scientist but you have to get a fake as fuck card and burn it which i really like that portion of it because there's only so many fake as fuck cards meaning there's a finite amount of like fakes that will be released and ever available but it really shows like the conviction on the artist side because you have to burn. And these things go for about a thousand bucks, something around that. So, you know, when an artist is doing this, they're like fueling the ecosystem. They're help helping the tokenomics of like the deflationary part of, you know, the fake as fuck card. And I just like that part of the conviction on the artist side. And like another part I, I like about ordinals is like the inscription cost is, you know, a part of, you know, if someone's doing a collection um, on Ethereum, it's it's you know you can do one or a million. It it doesn't change the the cost on the artist side, which I think it just helps meet the collectors at a at an interesting spot because you know a lot of fine art is made on good materials and that cost rolls into you know what that piece could sell for. And I think this is kind of a representation of that like digitally, but just kind of wanted to put some context on like 
how many of these things there will be and what it takes from the artist to 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 release one. Yeah, the the fake ASF it's such a a unique but cool dynamic. It really makes it uh, community owned um, in essence. Um, if there's anybody down down um, listening who wants to ask any of these guys some questions, um, please feel free to. And we can sit here and shoot the shit for a little bit longer, and then uh, we'll wrap it up here uh, pretty soon. Uh, Jake, uh, tell us a little bit about kind of what what are we expecting from you, or what are your kind of plans for for art, maybe even outside of uh, Pepe moving forward. You hinted at it a little bit um, earlier in the conversation. Um, just curious on what what you're cooking up. <laughs> yeah, I'm like so close to announcing something. I sort of feel like just talking about it here, but. Um, if you'll notice, do it. Do it. <laughs> hey, let me tell a little story. So, um, again, like I was mentioning in that that tweet that I sent out earlier, that's posted on top. Like, I've always noticed that like my work is more than just like it's not a physical artwork, right? It's a digital art piece, and like throughout my career, it's been displayed in so many different ways. I've had like small looping billboards. I've had films in screenings at festivals and theaters. I've had work that I've chopped up and put, you know past year all over the world on um different big billboards and stuff and at, at events like um art basel and things like that and i'm always being asked to like restructure my work or reformat it and on the timeline i'm always sharing still frames yeah. or making you know my work has like smaller loops within bigger loops and i can just cut them down or crop them or put pieces side by side from the same film and like it's not just sort of like resharing the same thing, like new, you get new insights. You sort of see the work differently. Like the work is a lot of different things all put together. Um, and like I was saying, like my major work is like a year of like daily drawing practice condensed down to like one minute and there's, you have to rewatch it to see it all. So um, I've mostly released just straight animations and like additions tend to be shorter loops. And my one of ones are like the one minute longer pieces. Um, I have done the night vision series, which is what I took one of my super rare pieces um, and we fractionalize it to every individual frame. Um, and so it's more accessible or people can collect like one image of it and you can kind of explore that work as every individual frame with metadata. Um, and I redeemed them for one of one signed prints It's called the night vision series. Um, but I've been wanting to find a way to release a work of art that has like all the variations of what it is as one nft essentially and that um you're you're collecting the work of art but you're collecting all the variations in the way it can be displayed all the variations um into the future that i come up with um so you guys can use your imagination to to see where this is leading maybe um but uh so it's going to be a new addition with like a, a really interesting dynamic about what the art is and giving collectors opportunities to um have some control uh, and variation in the way that they, they show it. Um, and then beyond that, I do have work that's just like uh, the fake rare community that are other communities uh, that curate sort of from artists around themes or, or have kind of provide different opportunities for, for me as an artist to reach different communities or show my support for um, different collections. And so I do have one more thing coming later this year as yeah. well. And then I'll just say real quick, because I have a lot of stuff going on with my family right now, I'm like not able to travel as much, but I am getting a lot of outreach and opportunities to show my work, like I was just saying, in physical spaces. If you haven't seen, like Loom Studios in New York has been like projecting my work floor to ceiling, literally on the floor. Like you can walk in rooms, you can like basically go inside of my work. <clears throat> and there's different opportunities to manipulate the timing and the, the, the look of my work in real time with interactive stuff. So... Um, Next year, I hope you guys will see a lot more of that, like real world activations and and not just like a, I did a physical print with Avant Art this year in particular, which is really awesome. Um, but not just like kind of physicals, but more of like experiences. From what, from what I hear, it sounds like you're going to make a rare Wojak. <laughs> <laughs> I've been asked about that too. I'm keeping track of it. Uh, that's awesome to hear. Uh, Dogfather, did you have your hand up? I yeah, I just wanted to add to Jake. I mean, that's really amazing what I hear. I, I really love your your approach with the stills and the animations. One thing you can do with uh, Ordinals, which is pretty cool, is the concept of recursion. 
where you can basically have all the stills in different ordinals and then you can put them together uh, basically in a film or however however long you want to have it. And uh, that's a pretty amazing and I think very suitable concept to have stills and animations and, and play around with them uh, with different kind of like um, pieces of the collection. So um, I think that that's definitely something that's well suited to what you're doing. I'll keep an eye on it. Honestly, I'm interested in any format that allows people to go deeper into my work yeah, that, and, and investigate it more. Yeah, Bunzi can help you with that. Also, Billy, who's down in the crowd, did um, recursion. That was like uh, seven gigs um, in total for for the the final image. Might have been a little bit bigger. So yeah, that's uh, I think the right. Definitely wasn't seven gigs. Was it or seven? Was it seven megabytes? I mean, my bad. Seven gigs is <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> like half the, that's like half the yeah the but, place for dude, the year of Bitcoin. Like, it felt like sixty nine gigs. It, it was it was a thick one. It was a thick one. But no, it it's it is uh, a medium I think that will really embrace because I think like Counterparty has been. It's so crazy to me how far ahead Counterparty was. Um, just everyone's like made all these new chain, done all this stuff, and we're all circling back to you know, this, this wallet that, you know, was made for free, hence the name. Um, but it's, it is just a cool cycle to see. Um, and just this artwork that gets so recycled and so it's just so disposable when, um, the whole premise of it is to be immutable and like the provenance and like, but there's just so much, I don't know, lack of a better word, like trash <laughs> on it that like, <laughs> There's just really, really strong art that's standing the test of time because um, that's what this this technology is for. Um, is you know the just that, and it's it's just refreshing at least for me because it seems like it, it was getting oversaturated and people were kind of abusing. Uh, this is sounding negative, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it's just really cool. Like with the bats getting you know the ledger collaboration. And kind of just like how most corporations and, you know, like Coinbase and all of these bigger things, whenever they try to do something, it comes across very cringe. And just like the the Ledger collaboration just came across very organic and very strong. And just want to, again, just congratulate you on that. Because when I saw that, it was, it was really, really cool to see, you know, someone from your, because I, you know, we've ta talked about it and just like how things came about for you very organically and just how you leaned into it and like really put in the work. And, um, now just having a collaboration with ledger. Um, and, you know, also congratulations on the addition to the family. Um, I kind of have a last question for you. Like after having your son, has that like changed your approach to, to any of your pieces? Um, I can only imagine, I, I don't have any children, but, um, it just seems like a very, big milestone and you kind of live uh not much like less selfishly is like what i've heard i don't know but but yeah i'd love yeah. to hear about that <clears throat> yeah man thank you for that yeah now it's uh he, he uh he just turned six months old a couple of weeks ago um fastest six months of my life unbelievable just like <laughs> this this is crazy um uh, i think you know how it affects at least the way that i work um <clears throat> even though the, you know well at least the first couple of months you know you're you're hitting uh some serious levels of sleep deprivation um there is just this i think i don't know it's so hard to describe it um i think it's like a level of confidence that him being gives me right i i just there's this thing where i feel like now that i'm a parent i can really just do anything i don't know if that makes sense it's a really weird you know mental kind of framework but um i just i think about him and at least the past six months i just feel really um i just have like a lot of faith in in what i'm doing like i, I feel so strongly and and convicted about it um and i think that it's definitely a byproduct of you know him being my son and him being present um on earth so um and and i think all that too like as an artist and i think about like my body of work and um 
my family and and just to say too like i'm very very you know jake had mentioned it earlier but it's one thing that i'm so grateful about for this space is that um it has enabled me a, a level of stability for my for my family and um for you know my my wife to be home with my son throughout the days and um just like incredibly blessed by all this right um but yeah i i think um you know i'm i just I feel really lucky. I think it's the, the only thing that I could say. Um, he has been uh, just like an absolute joy to watch grow over the past six months. And um, I know before b- before I know it, he's going to be probably too cool for dad. So I'm really just trying to like soak up all that time and um, spend it with him. Like some days I'll sit at my desk and kind of have him sitting on my lap and watching me work. Um, and it's just, I don't know, man, those, those moments are just really, really special um yeah papa life i uh, love that it's be- beautiful response meta moon is back on stage bro are you back are you are you with us might be muted again <laughs> all right the silent the silent killer on stage <laughs> i love it uh adam man i know you're a, you're a pops too uh how uh how do your kids inspire you to bro to- he's underselling how uh how how lack of sleep i mean zero <laughs> sleep bro for the first six months <laughs> yeah that's the hard all i can say brother is it gets easier it gets easier uh just hang on man it hang on it, it could that, those first six months are right they will make you question your sanity uh but it does get easier brother so hang on it's a blessing enjoy it take lots of pictures man <laughs> yeah I appreciate it, man. Yeah, I know. It's I it, it's funny to think my um pictures of my son on my phone are starting to uh tally higher than than Pepe memes. <laughs> um, a bit concerning. New new record for my photo storage on my on my phone. Oh, how funny, man. Well, you know, that's Jake, dude. I appreciate you guys for coming on. Bordelon, who came up on stage and everybody else. You know, it's a very awesome conversation. I'm glad. This is the second now Pepe show that we were able to host. We did Rare Pepe last week, Fake Rares this week. Uh, our plan is to do this every Wednesday. I will feature different people in the Rare Pepe and Fake Rare community. Um, really, you know, get the message out. Let the artists speak. It's literally, as Dogfather said, you know, 300 artists in Rare Pepe. And there's over 300 artists in Fake Rare. So uh, a lot of personalities out there. Very appreciative. If you guys didn't know, we do this show Tuesday through Thursday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Tomorrow, we do have a very special episode um, with the creator of Ordinal Theory, Casey Rodermore. We're doing that at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, So look out for that. Um, It's going to be an awesome time. We're going to talk about, you know, shit coins and kind of the the controversy that Casey's uh, created over the last few weeks. Should be a really, really fun conversation. Uh, Bunzi, any final words to close us out here, man? Mr. Fake Gray or Mullet Man? Dude, mullets fucked, bats geometric. What was the quote? Um, the there was one banger quote you had, bats. I want to end it. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, create a freedom through constraint. It's like the haiku model, brother. <laughs> yeah, dude, dude, I, I got high to that coup this morning, it was perfect, but. No, this is an awesome show. I, I do think that, you know, what Fake Rares and the Pepe Frog as a canvas has, has done for the internet is fucking crazy. And that's what's so cool about this shit. And, um, yeah, next Wednesday, um, we're going to be talking about Pepe again. And let's let's keep um, drawing frogs on the internet because in 100 years from now, that's going to be the most important thing. Frogs and frogs with mullets. Thank you, guys. Everyone have a re- good rest of your day. We'll see you guys tomorrow.